industry. It's pretty, pretty sweet that we're all here talking about this today. Um, so thank you and welcome. Um, yeah, so I'm Jamie Clark. I'm going to talk a little bit about density estimation using camera traps and what is possible today. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge at the outset that I didn't do this work alone. I have a few different collaborators, including Holger Bohm, who's the Provincial Ungulate Specialist for BC, um, Dr. Cole Burton, who leads the Wildlife Coexistence Lab out of the University of British Columbia, and Alexia Constantino, who was my predecessor as WildCam coordinator and who has now moved on to instructing at BCIT. Um, another acknowledgement that I would like to make is that this research took place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples. So that's the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Musqueam nations, as well as the Sin Ijkista people. Um, so just because I think some folks are not super familiar with WildCam, they might have heard about this webinar from Twitter or from many other channels, I thought I would just give a really brief overview of what is WildCam. So for those that don't know, we are a network of camera trappers for camera trappers, and our big goal is to support effective wildlife management by fostering collaboration. So a few things that we do are support a camera trapping community of practice. We create and share best practices, tools, and resources, including resources on some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today. Um, we coordinate camera trap projects across regions to improve monitoring and management, so scaling projects up essentially. We support data management, sharing and synthesis, and importantly, standardization. And we also engage with communities. Um, so if anybody in the audience today is not a member of WildCam and has even one camera trap in Western Canada, I really encourage you to join as a member. Um, you can check out wildcams.ca if that piques your interest or you can send me an email. So who is WildCam? WildCam is a collaboration between stakeholders in BC and Alberta. It's funded currently by the Ministry of Lands, or sorry, Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development, or what was formerly Flynnward. And it is administered by the Wildlife Coexistence Lab and by the BC Parks Foundation. Um, our members run the gamut. They're pretty much, like I said, anybody and everybody with camera traps in Western Canada. And our advisory committee is made up of university lab uh, researchers and professors as well as government um, folks in Alberta and in BC, and also BC Park staff. Um, and just to clarify this relationship, because you may see WildCam and BC Parks Foundation, um, I guess, promoted together. So WildCam is administered by the BC Parks Foundation, which is the official chari charitable partner of BC Parks and Protected Areas. Um, and then just a like lightning fast intro to who I am. So I'm Jamie Clark. Um, currently, I'm the WildCam coordinator. Previously, so the past year, all of 2022, I had a slightly different role within WildCam where I was doing all of this density work. Um, prior to joining WildCam, I worked as a research technician with the Wildlife Coexistence Lab. So this is a picture of me checking some cameras in the Southern Chilcotin Mountains Provincial Park. So I got a pretty good sense of what happens in the field and what happens when you process images and even a little bit of a sense of um, analysis. And now in this role that I just wrapped up and in my current role, I've delved a little bit more into the research and um, lit review side of things. And just a little PSA off the top, um, don't feel like you have to scramble and write everything down that we talk about today. Um, this material is going to be covered in a handbook, which I'll talk about later. So all of this information is going to be encapsulated in that document. Don't feel like you have to write anything down crazily or anything like that. Just enjoy the ride. <laughs> um, lovely. OK, so we're going to start off with a little bit of background just to make sure everybody is on super solid footing and we all know what we're talking about. Um, so this might seem really basic, but I think first off, we should define what is density. And it's nothing crazy. It's simply just the number of animals per unit area. So that's total population size divided by total area sampled. Um, and to really drive that home, we can take this simple example. So here I've got a two kilometer by two kilometer study area. So four kilometers squared. Within that study area, there are eight moose. Eight divided by four is two moose per kilometer squared. So typically this is how we report measures of density. 
if animals are super wide ranging or very low density, we might report this number in terms of animals per um, 100 kilometers squared, but this is, this is pretty much how you'll see it. So why is density useful? Um, for three main reasons. The first is monitoring. So we want to know our populations increasing or declining, our population size is changing in response to resource extraction or development or a new invasive species on the scene. The second reason is management. So particularly for game species, we want, we want to know how big a population is so we can sustainably hunt a certain amount of animals from that population. And then finally for assessment, we take a lot of management actions and it's pretty important for us to reflect and look back and make sure that those management actions are actually having the desired outcome. So estimates of density can be critical for wildlife stewardship. And the reason is because density is standardized over units of area. And so that allows us to compare across space and species and time much more easily than with other metrics like abundance, um, where when you compare abundance across space or species or time, the inferences can be a little muddied because we're not actually sure if differences are due to true differences in abundance or some other factor that we haven't accounted for. So in BC and many other places in Alberta, for example, we're often estimating wildlife population densities via aerial surveys. Um, so a wildlife manager or whoever, some kind of practitioner will hop into an aircraft, fly over a study area and count animals from the air. So the way that I like to envision this is we've got our green study area, we've got our squiggly um, white flight path, and then this inset image is what we're actually seeing out of the window of our helicopter, all these tiny little moose on the landscape. And I kind of like to frame this as like a zoomed out snapshot in time. So aerial surveys are sampling really large areas, really large swaths of land over a pretty short period of time. So we're getting this zoomed out snapshot of how many animals are on the landscape. And so oftentimes we are counting things like ungulates. So here are a couple of FRI research images of a caribou survey. Um, although we can also count other species groups like wolves and cougars, um, but oftentimes we're using this method for ungulates. So that sounds great. I mean, a helicopter ride sounds really awesome, but there are definitely some problems with this method. The first is that aerial surveys are very expensive. In BC, they cost about $14 to $1,500 an hour to fly. And because they're so pricey, we're not flying them very frequently and we're covering relatively few wildlife management units per year. So we're getting this really spotty and sporadic coverage of our province. The second issue is that aerial surveys are quite dangerous. Um, there was a study that came out in the early 2000s that showed that Aircraft surveys were the single most dangerous part of a wildlife biologist's job. And not only that, they're also a disturbance to wildlife. Um, and if that wasn't enough, they can also be limited in scope. So it makes sense that if we're spotting animals from the air, they have to be big enough, big enough, for, big enough for us to actually see them. So I've been told kind of like moose size enough is what we're reliably able to count from the air. Um, aerial surveys are often limited to open areas. I mean, that makes sense. We don't have x-ray vision. We can't count animals through dense forest. Um, and typically we're surveying for animals that have dark coat colors. So they're easiest to spot against um, a high contrast snowy background. So they're kind of species and landscape and season limited. And then on top of all of that, sometimes these surveys actually aren't producing very strong estimates of density. So the motivation for this work and some questions that Holger was asking himself are, is there a better way to estimate density? What else do we have in our toolkit that isn't an aerial survey? And more specifically, could camera traps be better than aerial surveys to get at this particular measure, which is density? But we realized that to answer these questions, first we actually need to find out how can we estimate population density using camera traps? What methods are actually available to us to calculate density? And that's where we encountered this really big problem, 
which is that information about camera trap density models is scattered all over the place. There are hundreds of papers, there's information in the gray lit, in reports, this information is everywhere. And I think it's kind of unrealistic to ask practitioners to make decisions about whether to use this tool if they have to read a year's worth of papers like I did to be able to make any kind of sense of what is out there. Um, so that was really the problem that we were tackling was that all of this information is everywhere. So we need to figure out what is available to us and then put it all into one single place. And that is the handbook. So a little bit more context. I'm not sure how familiar all of you are with camera trapping as a tool. So we'll just quickly go over how camera traps work. Um, and I just wanted to mention that I use this little um, image of a camera trap that Gabriella Palomo drew up. So thank you so much, Gabby, for creating that. Um, I've used it lots. So camera traps, we typically lash them to trees or wedge them between rocks or attach them to posts. And we leave them be in our study on our study landscape and they capture images of animals, of wildlife passively while we're not there. So if something has a temperature that is different from the environment and it moves within the camera's motion sensors, it'll trigger and it'll capture an image like this cute black bear. And so if we cast our minds back to the image about how aerial surveys sample the landscape and that's that zoomed out snapshot in time, camera traps sample the landscape pretty much in my mind in the opposite way. You're sampling a tiny, tiny sliver of space for a really, really long time, sometimes like weeks or months or years. Um, so we're much more at risk of encountering the same animals on our camera traps over and over and over again. And so that's something that we need to bear in mind and account for when we're calculating density using camera traps, because one part of density is how many animals are there. And we need to be able to reliably determine that number to calculate a proper density estimate. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the juicy bits, the camera trap density models. But before we delve into those, I do need to go over this first kind of fork in the road, which is to ask ourselves, are density estimates really needed? And maybe the answer is yes, you need to know absolute density. You want to know how many animals per unit area around the landscape, that's great. Then you would use density models, which are a focus today. But I just wanted to mention that there are also situations where you don't need to know absolute density. So you might choose to use something like relative abundance or occupancy, which are indices of density instead. So the way that I've divided this webinar and the handbook is into three different main categories, um, depending on the different kind of camera trap density model. So the first category are marked models. Those models are meant for animals that have um, unique distinguishing characteristics that help us um, identify them to the individual level. Unmarked models are for animals that don't have distinguishing features, so we can't ID them to the unique level. And then partially marked models are sort of an in-between that we're gonna touch on a little bit later once we have a better handle on the first two. And just um, another little disclaimer. So there is a lot of ongoing work to evaluate these models and how they perform relative to each other and relative to you know, traditional density estimation methods like aerial surveys. That work, some of that work is highlighted in, in the handbook, but it's not necessarily stuff we're going to go over today. Today, we're focusing on what is actually out there and how it works. So if you're curious about how these models have performed, I'm definitely going to point you towards the handbook on that. All right, so we're going to start off with marked models. And then just as a reminder, these models are for animals that have unique natural or artificial marks, and therefore we can assign them unique identities based on camera trap images. So at the top right here, we've got a goat with a collar and a tag that says number 12, we know who that is. On the bottom is a jaguar that has a unique pattern of spots on its coat, and we can use that unique pattern to um, identify that animal in camera trap images as well. So the first model that I'm gonna talk about today is one that you've probably heard of before. Um, it's capture recapture. 
So for this particular model, we're using um, individual detection histories to calculate population size and then dividing that number by the sampling area that we've sampled with our camera traps. Um, and so the way that this looks in practice is this matrix of detections, non-detections, and we're basically keeping track of whether we've detected an individual during a certain sampling occasion. So if we look at the top row here, individual one, during sampling occasion one, maybe that's day one, we haven't detected it, so that's represented by a zero. Same with sampling occasion two, but on sampling occasion three, we did see that animal, so that's represented by a one. So we've got this matrix of zeros and ones. So we use this information plus the probability that an individual is detected to solve for population size, and then we divide by area. But there are a couple problems with this model. The, I guess, most obvious problem is that sampling area is not explicitly measured. Um, we're only estimating sampling area ad hoc, which is a pretty big problem if that's only one of two inputs into your, into your density calculation. Um, Oftentimes people will create like a buffer, like draw a buffer around their camera array and make that their total sampling area, but that's a little bit of a guesstimate. Um, and that can pretty significantly impact your density estimates. The second issue is that detection probability changes across space. So it makes sense that animals that are really close to traps are gonna be captured all the time. They have a much higher detection probability than animals that are super far away from camera traps that are probably not going to be captured that often. They have a pretty different detection probability, and that's not accounted for in this model. And so that has led to the advent of spatial capture recapture models. Um, capture recapture has largely been phased out since this model was developed in 2008. And so spatial capture recapture models basically ask, where do animals live on the landscape? So they're taking an entire population and breaking it down into individual animals activity or home range centers. So that's this smattering of, of little dots on um, the right hand side. Um, so if we knew the number and location of each activity center, we could pretty easily estimate density. It would just be the number of activity centers, which we assume correlates with like one to one with the number of animals in the population divided by the area that encompasses all the activity centers. But the thing is, we don't actually know that information. If we did, it would be dead easy to calculate density. Instead, we're inferring that information from the spatial pattern of detections. So we can take a look at this little red dot um, that represents the activity center for one individual. And we can see that it was detected nine times quite close to its activity center. And then fewer times as we get farther away until it's not detected at all. So we can use this spatial pattern of detections to infer that that individual's activity center is probably located somewhere around where that red dot is. Um, so now we're going to move on to unmarked models. Um, and then as a reminder for this particular section, unmarked models are for animals that don't have unique marks, so they can't be individually identified. So the first model we're going to talk about is the spatial count model. And this model is essentially spatial capture recapture with um, extensions to account for the fact that we don't actually know animals' identities. So we're still breaking a population down into individual animals' activity centers, but we can't recreate these, um, uh, we can't recreate this, the record of where and when individuals were detected because we can't actually identify them. The only thing that we can do is tally how many detections there are at each camera trap. So for example, this camera in the middle, this is sort of like a heat map, um, diagram. This camera in the middle has quite a large circle, so a lot of detections versus smaller circles sort of at the outskirts of the camera trap array. That just represents the number of detections that we're getting at each of these camera traps. And so we use this information um, to estimate density using a whole bunch of math that we're not going to go into today, um, but it's pretty neat. And I would definitely point you to the handbook if you have more questions about specifics on this model.
Um, distance sampling is another cool one. So the cool bit about distance sampling is that you correct for imperfect detection. So animals that are actually present in your study area, but you're not seeing by measuring the distance from the observation point. So in this case, it's your camera trap and an animal. Um, and so you use this information to create a detection function, which basic, basically says that really, really close to the camera, you're detecting animals pretty much 100, well, the assumption is that you're detecting them 100% of the time. And then as you get farther and farther away from the camera trap, you're less and less likely to detect your animal. And so we use that detection function to account for the animals that are actually in your sampling area, but we're not observing. And you're combining that information with the number of animals that you actually are observing using your camera traps. I think this model is really cool. Um, this is the random encounter model. So for this model, we are assuming that animals are ideal gas particles. So they're ping-ponging around the landscape. They're not attracted to each other. They're not repelled by each other. They're not attracted or repelled by any landscape features. They're just kind of like bouncing around the landscape, randomly bouncing into camera traps as well. So the logic is that if animals move in this way, the rate at which they bump into camera traps is a function of animal movement speed. Um, of camera trap view shed area and of population density. So if we have measures of animal movement speed and if we can measure the view shed area, then we can calculate density. So something to note with this particular model is that yes, you do need measures of animal movement speed, ideally measures that are taken on the population of interest during the period of interest. So that essentially means that you're having to do a telemetry study on top of a camera trap study. Um, that's obviously not been done every time this particular model has been used, but that is what they say you should be doing. Um, but either way, you do need access to measures of animal movement speed. And then the view shed, uh, sorry, the area of the view shed is calculated using uh, the angle of the view shed as well as the radius of the view shed. So this particular model, the random encounter in stain time, Nakashima et al. developed it um, as an extension of the random encounter model where you don't need um, animal movement speed. Instead, what you use is the time that animals spend in the focal area because it's inversely proportional to animal movement speed. So you can imagine that the amount of time that an animal spends in the view shed will be less if it's moving very quickly, and it'll be longer if it's a very slow moving animal. Um, so for this model, you do need to calculate focal area. So I think Nakashima et al actually tested like this zone of certain detection using domestic animals. I know that folks have also uh, calculated this area using distance sampling methods, but that is something to bear in mind with, with this particular model. Um, another model is the time in front of the camera model. It, uh, there was recently a paper published on this model. Um, and so this model is based on quadrant sampling and it treats the camera view shed essentially like a vertical quadrant. So if you think back to your first year ecology class, you take your quadrant, you put it on some substrate and you count the number of organisms that are within that uh, bounded area. So we're kind of dealing with the same concept, except that we're sampling these tiny slivers of space over long periods of time, and we're sampling really mobile organisms. So we have to factor in um, time into our equation. So both the amount of time that individuals spend in the view shed, as well as the total camera operating time into our density uh, calculation. And something kind of cool about this model as well is that um, the authors, Becker et al, who may or may not be in the audience today, I can't see, um, they divided the view shed into distance bins to help um, determine view shed area. So animals were either detected within bin one or bin two. Um, all right, so this next model is called time to event. Um, Time to event analysis is actually used in many different disciplines to estimate the rate at which an event occurs. 
by repeatedly measuring the time that elapses before the event takes place. And so how this applies to camera traps and density estimation is that if we randomly deploy motion triggered cameras all over our study landscape, the time it takes to capture an image of an animal is a function of animal movement speed, detection probability, and population size. So if we know movement speed and if we assume that detection probability is perfect, then we can estimate population size by measuring the time from some arbitrary starting point until an image of an animal is captured. So I kind of like to visualize this model using cards. So if we imagine that we've set out our cameras, we leave them for X amount of time, and then we go out and we collect all those images, we can divide images, um, like we can stack them up according to occasion and sampling period. So let's say, for example, our sampling occasion is per day, and our sampling period is 24 one-hour periods in a day. So I can stack up all the images that I got on day one at noon, at 1 p.m., at 2 p.m., and then I'm going to go through, I'm going to flip through them and see how long it takes for me to flip over an image of my focal species. Um, so maybe on day one, I don't see any focal species. I'm flipping through all of my cards and I don't get any of my focal species. But on day two, after sampling period one, two, three, all the way up until sampling period 22, that's when I finally flip over my image of my focal species. So the time to event is 22 sampling periods on day two. So the space to event model is, is similar, but it's collapsed into um, an instant in time. Our sampling occasion is collapsed into an instant in time so that we don't need measures of animal movement speed. Um, so the way that we do this is instead of using motion triggered cameras, we're deploying cameras using the time lapse setting. So cameras are set to take images at predetermined periods of the day or night, maybe every hour or every day at noon, um, regardless of whether animals are in the frame or not. And by collapsing our sampling occasion in this way, we don't need measures of animal movement speed. So we can visualize this using the card analogy again. We've gone out, we've deployed all of our cameras randomly on the landscape. We've set them to take time-lapse images every hour on the hour. And then we go out and we collect all of our images and we're gonna stack them up. So we're gonna stack them up according to sampling occasions. So at noon, at 1 p.m., at 2 p.m., at 3 p.m. And then we're going to shuffle all of these cards. So this is a stack of images at noon from every camera in your array. You're gonna shuffle them all up and pick cards until you see an image of your focal species. And so what we're doing here is maybe on sampling occasion one at noon, um, we're pulling through and it takes us five cards for us to flip over an image of our focal species. So five cards and maybe our view shed area is 20 meters squared. Five times 20 meters squared is 100 meters squared. It's taken us 100 meters squared of space of area until we've drawn an image of our focal species. That's kind of the idea of this model. So the last two models that I'm going to talk about for this section are called site structured models. So there is a Royal Nichols model and an N mixture model. And these models are a little different from the other ones because instead of using an array of cameras to sample one big population, site structured models kind of treat each camera as though it's sampling some mini population within a meta population. So you're essentially calculating density per camera station and then extrapolate into the entire study area. Um, so for the Royal Nichols model, we're interested in detection on detection data, so zeros and ones. And for the end mixture model, we're interested in counts of animals and images. Okay, so now we're going to move on to partially marked models. So for this section, there are a few different kinds of partially marked models that hopefully we'll walk through and make and make the distinction really clear between them. So the first kind of partially marked model is for populations where a subset of animals are marked and a subset are not marked. So the population that uh, itself is partially marked. So for example, with this, with these images of goats, some animals are colored and have tags. We can tell who they are. Some animals are not colored and tagged. We, we can't tell those individuals apart. We can't tell who is who. Um, 
So in situations like this, we can use the spatial mark recite model, which like in a very crude way is kind of a hybrid model. So you're kind of doing spatial capture recapture on the marked subset of your population and spatial count on the unmarked subset of your population. And sort of similar to spatial count, like it is a little bit more nuanced than that. So I would definitely um, point you towards a handbook for more details. The second situation, so the first situation was our population is partially marked. In this situation, our image sets are partially identifying. So we can think about this situation like this. Um, oftentimes for spatial capture recapture, practitioners will deploy two cameras per station and the cameras are pointing towards each other so that when an animal like this cougar passes in front, you're capturing an image of the left and right flanks at the same time. And when we do that, we can assign both of those sides to the same individual. Versus the other situation, if we only have one camera trap set up per station, um, the left and right sides of animals are being captured separately. So we are at risk of erroneously assigning different identities to, this, to the different sides of one same animal. So the two flank spatial partial identity model um, sort of resolves this issue. It draws on the locations where partially identifying images were captured to resolve an animal's complete identity. So for example, if a left and right flank image um, are captured at the same location in really quick succession, we can use probability analysis to say it's, it's pretty likely that's the same individual given the turnaround time and the fact that it was captured in the same location. So we've dealt with a situation where populations themselves are partially marked, where image sets are partially identifying. Now we're dealing with a situation where individuals themselves are partially marked. So they're not numbered, they don't have any kind of unique coat pattern where we can say for sure we know who that animal is in the population. They are partially marked, so they have a suite of traits that help us partially resolve who these individuals are. And so the idea with this model, the categorical spatial partial identity model, is that we use categorical information information like sex or age class or color type to create um, like a suite of categorical traits that differs an animal that we observe from other animals that we observe in an incomplete way. And when we do that, we kind of divide a population into these different categorical identifiers and we can perform spatial count on smaller groups, which improves our inference. It improves our inference about density. So just to take a little bit of an example, um, we have this image of a caribou. She's a female, she's an adult, she's got a collar, she's got two antler point counts. This suite, this suite of traits, her full categorical identity helps us distinguish her from other members of the population. Not completely, we can't be absolutely sure who she is within her population, but we know that she's not a male without a collar with three antler points, for example. Okay, so the outcomes of all of this work, I've sort of, I mean, I haven't alluded to it, I've told you what they are, um, but it's that we've written a handbook that basically encapsulates everything that I've talked about today and more. So it summarizes and explains how these different density models work. It lists their critical assumptions and the effects of violating those assumptions. It also lists advantages and disadvantages of models and discusses how they performed in simulations and empirical tests and compared to each other and these traditional density estimation methods. And critically, all of this information is contained in one single document. So the handbook is just in its final stages of review, but it will soon be available to read at wildkims.ca under the resources tab, which I've circled in orange here. So keep your eyes peeled for that. It should be coming out pretty soon. Um, and just as a little teaser, uh, this is one of the tools that we developed as part of this work. It's a decision tree to help us choose a model based on project and population features. So can you individually identify your animals? Yes or no. Um, do you have access to auxiliary information? Yes or no. What's the most logical to implement? Is your population high or low density? 
So this decision tree can help you um, reach a conclusion about which model is best for your particular circumstances. It's also paired with a table that goes into a bit more detail about this information as well. So all of this is really, really great. We have a way better sense of what is out there, how it works, but we still want to know what's best. If we know what's possible, the logical next step is we want to know what's best. Um, which models perform best? Which ones should we be using? When and why? So we still have a lot of unanswered questions that need a lot of work to answer still. So I'm planning to do my master's in the summer or fall and test um, a selection of these camera trap models on ungulates in British Columbia and test how accurate and precise and consistent they are versus concurrent aerial surveys. And I'm also pretty interested in um, delving a little bit more into how robust these density models are to assumption violations and to different sampling designs, because this is something that is covered in some of the literature that I've read, but there are definitely unanswered questions. Um, and sampling design in particular, a lot of unmarked models um, require cameras to be deployed randomly on the landscape, but that can be pretty tricky to do in practice, especially in a place like British Columbia or Alberta. Um, so I'm really curious to know if we can sort of stretch that requirement and use different sampling designs instead. And the ultimate goal here is that we can make guidelines for practitioners. So it's great that now, you know, if you're a practitioner, you don't have to read 600 papers to find out what's out there and what's best and how it works. All that information is contained within the handbook, but we can't really tell you yet what's best and what to use in different cir uh, circumstances, um, how to set your camera traps up, all of that kind of stuff. So if you wanna make this tool and these analytical methods really accessible to practitioners, we need to make some recommendations and that's the ultimate goal with this. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge before we take questions that this project was funded by the province of British Columbia through what it was formerly the Ministry of Forests, Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development. Um, and that's it for me. I'm happy to take your questions. <laughs> lots of clap, lots of clap. Yeah, there's no questions in the chat, so feel free to put your hand up and we'll try and uh, and get to those who put their hand up first. Uh, Paul's got one that popped up there. Go ahead, Paul. Great, thank you. Um, very fascinating. And as you'll see in the chat, actually um, really relevant to some questions here in the Yukon we have right now as well. I'm wondering if you considered or if anything came up in your review around um, how this might be used, some of these methods might be used either to um, complement or even um, maybe to replace uh, other data sources that might be kind of lacking in either completeness or quality. So for example, in cases where you might not have um, a really robust and complete set of harvest data, let's say coming in, um, are there potentially ways that, that some of this the data coming in from these kind of camera trap models could be used to sort of um, at least estimate some some harvest mortality. Yeah, so a couple of things come to mind. I've definitely seen or read about situations where people use this kind of data um, to supplement other data sources. So if you can't go out and do a survey very frequently, maybe it's really expensive or really labor intensive, you can do camera trap survey sort of as a placeholder to gather some kind of information, maybe direct your future efforts. Um, I've also talked to a few folks who are pretty keen on camera trap data as a source of information for integrated population models. Um, so I guess that sort of gets at your, your point about these incomplete data sets that kind of come together and say something a little bit more meaningful than any one method can, if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, that's great, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. All right, next, I just saw somebody, but it seems like they disappeared, so I'm not sure if they changed their mind. Let's see here. There's a question in the chat. Um, someone said, I'm still confused as to how a spatial count without marked individuals can get an accurate density. 
when the data can't tell if it's the same individual passing the same camera. Can you explain the details a bit more? Ooh, putting me on the spot. Um, so I guess the, a, a bit of a cop-out answer is there is definitely more going on than what I touched on. Like there's some really mathy stuff going on. Um, but that is a great point that some of these unmarked models and spatial count in particular can produce pretty crummy density estimates. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far to say as it's like useless or anything like that. I don't think that's true, but it is hard to get accurate density estimates with some of these models where you can't identify individuals because you're relying on so many model parameters and assumptions and things like that. So you do have to set your camera trap arrays up um, with a lot of thought and consideration. Yeah. <laughs> No other questions so far. Okay, guys, you got to have some more questions. Oh, there's one in the chat that just popped up. Um, did you explore the, uh, the use, how the use of attractants might affect the various models? Yes, yeah, so that's that's pretty model dependent. Um, generally speaking, unmarked models require cameras to be randomly deployed. You can't have animals attracted to or repelled by camera stations, but you can use lure for certain uh, models like spatial capture recapture um, to maximize the number of captures and recaptures that you're getting. So it's it's pretty model dependent, but like a, a blanket statement is that that generally doesn't fly for um, unmarked models, except for maybe some of the site structured models. I'd have to double check with the handbook. I, I can't remember off the top of my head for that one. We have another question in the chat. When do you expect the handbook to be available? No oh, that's a wonderful, wonderful question. Um, it really is ready to go, except we just need to make a couple of final decisions. So I think pretty imminently, like I would say, without putting too much pressure on myself, like next week, <laughs> um, it, it, it is like very much ready to go though, yeah. Will you be sharing it at the ACTWS conference? I won't be personally attending. Um, so I don't know if I can answer that. I don't think we have any plans to distribute things like hard copies. Um, so I think if you head to the WildCam website, that's probably your best bet. But I think Cassie's going to be there. So Cassie can show you the website if you want. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, one second here. I'm wondering if you've explored the use of these methods at different times of year um, and how that affected the models and results. For example, during hunting and on hunting seasons as feeding and movement patterns changed. Yeah, that's a really, really great, great question. So some of these models, the first thing that comes to my mind is that some of these models stipulate that your population needs to be closed. So you would probably have to limit your study to either like within hunting season or outside of hunting season um, but that's a really great thing that's a really great thing to think about um, seasonally in terms of like like excluding hunting seasons and stuff i don't know if i've seen much about how these models perform in like winter versus summer for example that's a really interesting question. A lot of them are bounded in time to a certain season, um, but that would be an interesting thing to test. And that sort of leads into another thing that we're pretty keen on exploring further, which is that a lot of these models haven't been tested on landscapes like we have in BC or on species like we have in BC. Um, they've been tested on like entirely different continents or in like prairie land in the US. So. Um, there are definitely some unanswered questions there surrounding how these models perform in the systems that we are interested in BC or folks that are elsewhere, like in their particular landscapes. Andrew's asking next, uh, will the handbook include any tutorial style aspects to it? Uh, for example, uh, actual chunks of code. I wish. Um, so, so far, the extent that we've gotten to that 
like to a tutorial type thing is that uh, in the table that's listed below the um, decision tree, we've got links to code if I was able to find it. But I actually haven't used these models, like I haven't analyzed data using these models myself. But that is something that I'm hoping to do for the models that I test in my own work, if it happens. Um, I'd like to create like an ease of use score and compare how these different models, um, like how easy they are to implement in the field, how tricky they are to process for and how tricky it is to actually analyze the data um, in R or whatever whatever program you use. But so I guess to, to your point, like there is a summary of code where people have posted it or shared it, um, but I don't have any kind of walkthroughs or anything like that available. But that'd be amazing. Just checking to make sure there's no hands up here because we always like to hear from people face to face, but no. Next one was, I'm not sure actually if the, the slide's going to be available via PDF. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know. I hadn't thought about that. Uh, the recording will be available probably on the Wildcam website, though, if you want to hear me talk about it. Um, if there's a lot of interest for the slides themselves, so I, I'm, I suppose we could probably find a, a place to share those. All right, next one. Have you come across evidence to suggest whether one method um, or design is more suitable for multiple species surveys rather than single species surveys? Yes, so generally speaking, camera traps are a pretty great tool for multi-species surveys. Um, that's definitely one of the strengths of this tool is that you can estimate density for many species at once in comparison to something like an aerial survey where each survey is a single species effort. Um, with camera traps, though, you still will encounter some limitations with that. So you can't survey like mice and moose at the same time because they're pretty drastically different. You would have to set your camera traps up. I don't even know how you would set your camera traps up to do that. Um, so they are definitely a multi-species tool, and you can estimate multi-species density using like one model and one array. Um, but you would have to factor in how the landscape and and your species of interest, how you would have to set up your array to do that. Jamie, I have no more. Totally fine. Um, yeah, so I guess if folks are too shy to ask the questions here, which is totally fine, I get that, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, likewise, if you take a look at the handbook and you have feedback, please send me a message. I'll share my email um, on the same page where we post the handbook. Definitely open to feedback. It's only made this tool better and better. So yeah please share your thoughts with me or your questions. A lot of kudos in the chat. Great presentation. <laughs> Everybody wants the PDF though. So Colleen yes. suggested uh, a watermarking. It might be a good opportunity to do so without sort of sharing information you don't want to share. Trying to make sure there's no other questions here. Jamie is boss. I agree. <laughs> totally awesome. Great Actually, work. Cassie, Cassie, can I just clarify that? It's it's oh sure. Yeah, it's not about sharing information you don't want to share. If you don't want to share it, you 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 just shouldn't. It's just that um, I'm acknowledging there's so much um, intellectual property in this presentation, Jamie, and and it was a really great presentation. Just so dense with such helpful information I can imagine everyone listening would like to keep it as a resource but it it takes time to put those things together and and credit should always be given where it's due so so my suggestion of a watermark is a, quite a different purpose just to make sure that that credit is always given to you when anyone reuses that material yeah that's that's a great suggestion thank you it's something that I haven't really thought about too in depth yet because just been in the throes of writing the dang thing, <laughs> but definitely was, something important to consider. Oh, it was really awesome. That was an incredible presentation. Thank you so much. Nope, just clap still. 
<laughs> for a few more minutes. So feel free to stick around if you have questions. I'm sure Jamie won't mind even more kudos, but there's there's a lot. There's a lot of great <laughs> notes in the comments, Jamie. So great work, great job. And thank you so much for sharing it with us again. Yeah, thank you so much for, for coming and asking your questions and for listen, listening to me talk about this thing that has consumed me for the past year. <laughs> it's nice to talk to real people about it and not just think about it in my brain. <laughs> Yeah, I must admit that, um, you know, working on the Alberta or the, well, sorry, not Alberta, but the Wildlife Camry Survey Protocol, realizing that you had, you were working on this, I was, I was so glad because my brain was exploding <laughs> trying to figure out all these density models. So I am also super appreciative personally. Thank you. <laughs> no problem, Kelsey. <laughs> Yep, I think everyone's just sort of sticking around. Maybe they're checking their email or just seeing if any other questions come up, but feel free to leave. Feel free to um, <clears throat> forward uh, any other questions that come up to Jamie. Um, also questions about WildCam. If you have any questions about the Alberta Remote Camera Community of Practice, you can email me. I threw those in the chat. Um, you might have to kind of scroll up for them though, so I'll just maybe post them again. Okay, we have another question. Seems like Reconyx so, cameras are the most commonly used, but wondering if there's uh, thoughts been given towards standardizing something about cameras that should be used for density uh, estimation. Mm, and, that's, yeah. a, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure that I'm in a position to answer that question, to be honest. I haven't, I'm not familiar with a lot of the other models that are out there. I've only really used Reconyx. Um, but there are definitely, definitely things that need to be standardized for density estimation, like viewshed area, viewshed angle, um, the distance from which uh, the camera can capture mm -hmm. images, like detect animals. That's pretty model and make dependent. Um, so I touch on that a little bit in the handbook, like things that you have to measure that are particular to makes and models. And then also like your landscape of interest and things like that. Um, I can't really think of a reason why one would be better for density estimation than another, aside from things like battery life and stuff like that, which is not stuff that I'm super familiar with. Um, I guess another thing to mention too, is that some of these models require use of the time-lapse function or some of them work better with video. So that's something that you need to factor into your camera purchase or use is whether these, these units are actually able to do the things that you want them to do for your density estimate. Okay, one more question, at least maybe two. Um, any involvement of Yukon, the Yukon, um, sorry, Yukon works, so I'm assuming projects in the Yukon um, in WildCam so far? Oh, that's a good question. I don't think so. I, we've got folks in the Northwest Territories, but if you're from the Yukon, add your camera projects. That would be so great. That'd be so, so great. We are definitely looking to fill out the map and share your really sweet camera projects with as many people as possible. So if you're from the Yukon, add your projects. That'd be so great. <laughs> that was from Paul. Oh, Colleen had a comment. Um, she's Finding Brownings to be 20% of the price, easier to set up, quicker to switch batteries, uh, with no differences in her test sensitivity. But this testing is pretty anecdotal, not comprehensive. Yeah, I guess in terms of model comparisons, there, there are a couple of resources on the WildCam website. I can't speak to how recent they are. They might have been, like there might be updated updates needed since those were posted, but um, yeah, there are different comparisons that exist online. I think a, a lot of it is personal preference too um, and what you're familiar with. But yeah, I haven't used Browning, so I'm glad to hear that they work. <laughs> I have to stay away from Bushnell myself for many reasons, for any model. <laughs> <clears throat> no, I think that's it. Thanks so much again for joining.
Yeah, thanks everybody. We could probably we could probably end it if you'd like. I don't think there's any. I was wondering if Anne was staying on to chat, but looks like she left. I just need to figure out how to um, save all of these messages, all these chat messages. Oh, I think I can just um, copy and paste it. OK, that would be lovely, because I want to make sure I didn't miss anybody's comments or questions. Lovely. Okay. Yeah. I suppose we can, um, we can stop it there.